solubility of various stone forming salts within the urine, promoters of crystallization and aggregation, as well as inhibitors of crystallization and aggregation of stone crystals. And what I'd like to focus on this morning are some recent advances uh, with regards to nephrolithiasis, specifically with regards to promoters, the impact of dietary sodium and calcium, as well as calcium supplements, and also the impact of a high acid asher animal protein diet. And then I'd like to talk about epidemiologic patterns that have been changing due to increased incidence of obesity and changes in lifestyle across the world. And then finally, I'll talk about inhibitors of nephrolithiasis, specifically the use of potassium citrate to help manage stone disease. Now we classify stones into two large groups, either those containing calcium or non-calcium containing stones. Uh, and I'll first focus on hypercalciuria because hypercalciuria is the number one cause of calcaneus or calcium containing calculi. The physiology or the metabolic defect in absorptive hypercalciuria is there's increased intestinal calcium absorption, which increases the filtered load and subsequently the plasma calcium. This will in turn downregulate PTH and downregulate uh, uh, and cause your uh, increase in urinary calcium. In contrast, patients with renal leak hypercalciuria, the primary defect is in the distal tubule where these patients leak calcium from the urine and this increased urinary calcium will cause a decrease uh, slightly in plasma calcium. It will stimulate the production of PTH uh, with subsequent increase in intestinal calcium absorption, as well as an increase in resorption of calcium from the bone. So it's important to remember that um, sodium uh, in the diet and subsequently increased sodium levels in the urine have a major impact on calcium stone formation, because oral sodium intake is a major determinant of renal calcium excretion, and that if you increase the sodium in the urine by 100 milliequivalents per day, you will also increase the urinary calcium by 50 milligrams per day. And it's also important to remember that excessive urinary sodium will block the hypocalciuric action of thiazide diuretics. So why not, uh, what about the impact of dietary calcium? Well, again, back when I was a resident, it was taught that we should restrict dietary calcium in our calcium stone formers. However, about 25 years ago, there were two large epidemiologic studies that both demonstrated that calcium intake was inversely associated with stone formation and that if you put a patient on a low calcium diet, you would increase the risk for calcium stone formation. Now, subsequently in 2002, Borghi from Italy performed the first and most well-performed randomized prospective trial looking at the impact of dietary calcium. This was a five-year randomized prospective trial in 120 men with hypercalciuria, half were placed on a low calcium diet that included uh, normal sodium and normal protein, where the other half were placed on a regular calcium diet, but were given specific instructions for low sodium and low protein. So, if you followed these patients for five years, you found that the patients placed on the low calcium but normal sodium group had no significant change in their urinary sodium, but the patients on the normal calcium, low sodium, low protein group had a significant reduction in their urinary, um, in their urinary sodium excretion. The patients placed on the low calcium diet also had a significant reduction in their urinary calcium, 
But again, since we said that the low sodium impacts urinary calcium excretion, those patients placed on the normal calcium low sodium diet had a similar reduction in their urinary calcium. The patients placed on the low calcium diet had a slight increase in urinary oxalate, but since there was less, there was less calcium uh, in their urine to bind with the oxalate, the oxalate in the urine was increased. The patients on the normal calcium diet, however, uh, had in fact a slight reduction in their urinary oxalate. So taking this all together uh, and looking specifically at the cumulative incidence of stone recurrence, the patients on the normal calcium, low protein, low salt diet had a significantly reduced incidence of recurrent stone formation as compared to those patients placed on the low calcium diet alone. So I would recommend as general dietary advice that most patients with calcium containing stones should be placed on a normal calcium diet, that a mo moderate calcium restriction should be advised in patients with documented absorptive hypercalcuria, that you should moderate the intake of high oxalate containing foods, specifically spinach, tea, chocolate, and nuts. And we should also try to limit our dietary sodium and animal protein intake in those individuals that have calcium stones. So the foods to avoid are those with high sodium uh, with chocolate or nuts and excessive animal protein. Well, what about calcium supplements? Can they be a cause of stone formation? Well, it really depends on the clinical and physiologic data that supports this concept. Uh, and uh, what we find is that for the majority of Premenopausal women, calcium supplements can increase the risk of stones, but postmenopausal women, calcium supplements have minimal impact. It's also important to talk about the calcium supplement itself. And I would recommend using calcium citrate. It's marketed here in the United States as a as, as a over-the-counter calcium supplement called Citracal. And it's been shown to prevent the supersaturation of calcium salts and appears to be a more stone-friendly calcium supplement because of the citrate in this calcium citrate preparation. And there's been a couple long-term clinical trials to date, and one of them reported about uh, 20, 20 years ago, uh, suggested that there was no significant change in the urinary saturation of either calcium oxalate or calcium phosphate. There was no increased propensity for the crystallization of calcium salts, and it was mainly due to the protective effect of citrate in the calcium citrate. So my recommendation to you is that if you have a patient that either needs to be or wants to be on a calcium supplement, that you should check a 24-hour urine calcium four months after the patient begins their calcium supplementation. And if the patient has a normal urinary calcium, well, there's nothing to do at that point. Uh, you don't have to worry about the calcium supplement. But if the patient is hypercalcuric on their calcium supplement, you can easily start a thiazide diuretic uh, to control their urinary calcium and allow them to continue to take the calcium supplement. Now, as I mentioned at the outset of my talk, there's been a significant change in the epidemiologic pattern of stone disease. And it's thought that dietary changes are potentially responsible for the increased incidence and changing trends in both calcium oxalate and uric acid stones. And this is thought to be mostly to a change um, not only in the United States, but across the world in people eating a higher animal protein diet and the increased incidence of obesity throughout the world. Now, the impact of a high animal protein diet is really seen best in this 
prospective controlled study that was performed almost 30 years ago, where patients were uh, placed in a metabolic research unit and given an, an identical diet with identical amount of protein, with the difference being the type of protein that the patients ingested. The first phase of the of the um, diet was, an, was a vegetable protein without egg, the second phase, a vegetable protein, and the third phase, animal protein alone. And you can see as you go from a pure vegan diet to an animal protein diet, that there's a significant decrease in the urine pH, a significant increase in the urinary calcium, a significant reduction in the urinary citrate, an increase in the urinary uric acid, a significant increase in the saturation of calcium oxalate, and a decrease in the inhibitor activity against calcium oxalate stone formation. So basically going from a vegan diet to an animal protein diet increases all the risk factors for recurrent calcium stone disease. So it's important to remember that acidosis um, due to a high animal protein diet or patients that have other conditions which can increase the acid load within the body, acidosis has significant impacts on bone, intestine, and kidney to increase the risk for kidney stones. Acidosis will cause hypercalciuria and a negative calcium balance, and acidosis will decrease urinary citrate synthesis and increased tubular reabsorption of citrate, both um, increasing uh, the risk of hypocitraturia. So hypercalciuria, hypocitraturia, the two major risk factors for recurrent calcium oxalate stone disease. So how do these uh, changes in epidemiology uh, actually document? Well, these are data from Chuck Scales, who's one of my partners at Duke, where uh, he looked at a five-year change in the incidence of stones from 1997 to 2002, showing that while there was an increase in stone disease in males, there was an even more significant increase in stone disease in females, and this was for renal stones. Uh, so again, this significant increase in stone disease that we've seen across the U.S. and across the world is not due to a decrease um, uh, in male stone formation, but a significant increase in female stones. And so when recalculated, the male to gender ratio, which 30 years ago had been three males to one female, it's now 1.3 males to one female in 2002. And it's more like one male to one female uh, that we've seen in recent studies in 2019. And again, it's due to changes in diet and lifestyle and the increasing incidence of obesity. And these are the data, uh, again, the most recent data uh, showing uh, now a male to female ratio of 49.3 males to 50.7 females, essentially a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio for male to female stone disease. Uh, and it again is due to, again, probably changes in diet and lifestyle. Now, as I said at the outset, one of the epidemics that we have in the United States beside COVID at this time is obesity. And obesity is a worldwide epidemic. And these are just data up to 2014. The, um, the darker, uh, the red color, the higher incidence of obesity in the, this particular part of the United States. Uh, but now in 2020, uh, the map is almost all dark red because of the high incidence of obesity. We've been interested in obesity and its impact on stone formation. And we did a study of 2004 where we looked at our uh, stone population at Duke and about 1,000 patients. 
we found that 14% of them were morbidly obese, uh, and we had data on 83 of these obese patients. And what we found is that if we compared the uh, metabolic diagnoses in our obese stone formers as compared to the control group, which consisted of stone formers who were not obese, that were of normal size, we found that there was a higher incidence of gouty diathesis, uh, meaning a low urine pH, a higher incidence of hyperuricosuria, hypercalciuria, uh, as compared to those normal sized stone formers. And if we looked at the prevalence of uric acid stones, the patients that were obese had almost a six fold increase in the incidence of uric acid stones as compared to those patients who were uric acid stone formers in normal size. Well, why do we see low urine pH in patients who are obese? Well, the majority of obese patients have type 2 diabetes that causes insulin resistance with impaired ammonium excretion leading to a decrease in urine pH and subsequent uric acid stone formation. And these are data uh, uh, from a uh, large study that we performed a number of years ago looking at patients with uric acid stones, the reported incidence of uric acid stones in the literature is about 8%, about 6% in non-diabetics. But if you were diabetic, you had a 35% chance of having uric acid stones. And these data from the two largest stone clinics in the United States demonstrate that urinary pH is inversely associated with the weight of the patient. So as the patient became more obese, the urine pH would continue to drop. Uh, and so uh, a obesity is associated with a acidic urine that increases the risk of both uric acid and calcium oxalate stones. And again, data from our retrospective study in 2004 showing that if we treated our patients, both obese patients and normal sized patients with appropriate medication in this, uh, in this case with potassium citrate, we could significantly reduce the number of stones per patient per year going from about two stones per patient per year down to 0.2 or a tenfold reduction in the incidence of recurrent stone formation. We know that potassium citrate forms soluble complexes with calcium and it lowers the saturation of calcium salts. And that citrate also directly inhibits the crystallization of calcium salts within the urine. Hypocitraturia is the second most common problem we see in our stone forming population. And about five to 10% of our patients uh, have hypocitraturia as their sole metabolic abnormality. And it's found as a mixed abnormality in about 50% of our patients. When do we see hypocitraturia? Well, in any condition that causes acidosis, such as those individuals with distal RTA, chronic diarrhea, excessive physical exercise causing lactic acidosis, a high acid ash diet, or potassium depletion causing intracellular acidosis, for example, for those patients taking thiazide diuretics. Now, potassium citrate has been shown to be an invaluable medication to uh, counteract hypocitraturia and reduce the risk of stone disease. These are data from the first randomized prospective trial uh, showing that the patients that were treated with potassium citrate had a 72% remission rate, whereas those individuals taking placebo, only 20% of them stopped forming stones. And this prospective randomized trial, again, demonstrated a tenfold reduction in recurrent stone formation in the potassium citrate group as compared to no change in the incidence of recurrent stones 
in those individuals who received placebo. Currently, there are different preparations of potassium citrate, um, either liquid or crystal form or slow release forms. And I believe that potassium citrate is a medication that you can easily get in Indonesia to use for your uh, patients with recurrent stones and hypocitraturia. So what I hope I've done over the last 20 minutes or so is given you a very quick overview of some of the important takeaway messages for managing your patients with recurrent stones. And looking towards the future, I believe we'll be hearing a lot more about dietary impact on calcium oxalate stone disease. We'll be hearing more about new medications that are currently undergoing clinical trials, as well as enteric therapy that might impact the uh, gut biome and essentially genetic therapy, which is also under investigation to manage patients with hypercalciuria and cysteuria. So again, I appreciate your having me um, speak this morning and I would be happy to uh, answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Professor. So I can negotiation. I think we can pull the pay on the I'm sorry, Weedy, I didn't hear what you said. Uh, I think we can pull so I think you can proceed to your second session now. So the second session, okay. Yes. Okay, uh, can you see this uh, slide of, okay. Sorry, Prof. Len. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, is this, can you, can you see my slides now? Yeah, I can see, but th there are some gray box on the upper area on your slide. I think it was because of the optimization of, your, of the video. So if you don't mind, uh, can you turn off the sharing the optimized video because uh, I read it from the Zoom because there are some risks. There are some gray box on your uh, screen because of the optimization of the video. Yes. Is that better? Yeah, very better. It's very clear, I'm sorry. Good, okay. Well, uh, thank you again and uh, now I'd like to speak specifically about innovations in the management of ureteral calculi. These are my disclosures for this talk. So the management of ureteral calculi has changed dramatically over the years, uh, but I think it's important to remember that in many cases, ureteral stones will pass spontaneously. And there have been a number of randomized prospective trials. And this um, particular chart looks at a, a meta-analysis um, of um, multiple trials looking at the impact of alpha blockers, demonstrating that um, alpha blockers will significantly increase uh, the chance of a spontaneous passage. There's still some debate in the literature, however, uh, and but I think this uh, 2008 multi-center trial from China uh, really has, uh, really has uh, put this question to rest. 
because we now know that uh, with alpha blockers, you can significantly increase the incidence of stone expulsion. You can reduce the time to stone passage and also reduce the need uh, for pain medication without increasing side effects. However, it's thought that the primary benefit is in patients with stones that are greater than five millimeters in diameter. Also remember that medical expulsive therapy with alpha blockers can also offer a significant cost savings over recurrent surgical therapy. If you look, look at the, the cost of surgical intervention for stones in the US, ureteroscopy can cost about $2,600 and shockwave lithotripsy $4,200. Um, uh, but a one month supply of medical expulsive therapy uh, costs less than $100 per month, a significant uh, reduction in cost. And this is just an example of one such patient that um, I took care of recently. Uh, this was his CT in the emergency department. You can see the hydronephrosis in the right kidney, the large uh, one centimeter um, stone in the mid ureter on both the axial and the transverse image. We started the patient on alpha blocker, but scheduled him for surgery because we weren't convinced that this stone would pass. And he called uh, me the day before surgery to say, I just passed my stone. So I do think that alpha blockers have a role, uh, even in the age of shockwave lithotripsy and ureteroscopy. And there's no doubt that in stones that don't pass, um, our philosophy for treating ureteral stones has changed dramatically. Uh, back in the 80s, uh, shockwave lithotripsy was the main way that we took care of patients with stones. But I would offer now in, 2000, in the 2020s, uh, we now see uh, upwards of 70 to 85 percent of patients being treated with ureteroscopy for management of their symptomatic stones that did not pass. Now, I had the good pleasure of participating in the joint um, American Urological Association and European Association of Urology Guidelines. And in 2007, we came out with a set of guidelines that said, for patients with ureteral stones that are less than two centimeters who fail medical therapy, that shock lithotripsy or ureteroscopy or both should be both considered first line stone treatments and that patients should be informed that ureteroscopy is associated with a significantly higher stone-free rate and a better chance of becoming stone-free with a single procedure. And indeed, if we look at the stone-free rates for proximal ureteral calculi in the 1997 guidelines as compared to the 2007 guidelines, you can see that for ureteroscopy, um, the incidence of uh, a complete stone removal or stone free was significantly higher uh, than was for shockwave lithotripsy. And for distal ureteral calculi, ureteroscopy again offered a superior stone free rate at 97% as compared to any other stone modality. So why has our treatment philosophy changed? Well, I believe it's due to improvements in endoscopic technology, specific, uh, specifically the introduction of digital endoscopes and enhanced nitinol instrumentation to help us remove these ureteral stones. I think all of you are familiar with uh, the uh, Olympus flexible ureteroscope. Uh, these became digital about 20 years ago. Um, and it's well known now that uh, digital uh, imaging provides a superior optical image as compared to standard fiber optics. And uh, not only does 
uh, the video, you read uh, have the uh, uh, much better visualization than a standard fiber optic, but, but you can also use things, things like narrow band imaging as seen in this particular video clip. Also, there are semi-rigid digital ureteroscopes available. And studies have demonstrated that digital ureteroscopy uh, provides um, superior results than standard fiber optic. And in this particular study from 2011, a significant reduction in operative time using digital ureteroscopy uh, with uh, equal stone free rates and reduced need for repairs. Now in 2016, the American Urological Association updated their guidelines on management of ureteral stones. And here again, we can see that the for stone for patients that had um, middle, proximal, and distal ureteral stones, that ureteroscopy offers a significantly increased chance of becoming stone free for smaller stones, less than one centimeter, as well as for larger stones. So ureteroscopy can be used for any size stone uh, within the ureter. We talked about the flexible ureteroscope having a major impact. Um, however, in many parts of the world, uh, it's expensive to have a reusable flexible ureteroscope. And you have to think about not only the cost of purchase, but also the cost of processing the scope, of servicing uh, the scope, uh, a service contract, as well as repair costs. And unfortunately, the handling of various flexible endoscopes in my operating room and potentially your operating room is not always optimal. And this is a picture from my operating room uh, showing that unfortunately, these uh, flexible scopes are not, were not being handled properly. Uh, and the only good news here is that uh, these, were, these were GI scopes and not ureteroscopes. So the whole concept of a single use digital flexible ureteroscope was introduced over 10 years ago with the thinking that the value of a single use scope uh, was significant. What if you had a single use digital flexible ureteroscope that had similar optics and maneuverability as a standard flexible ureteroscope? What if you had a brand new flexible ureteroscope for every case? And what if the single use ureteroscope cost was similar to a standard flexible ureteroscope? Well, we had the good fortune to work with Boston Scientific and five years ago was the first uh, institution in the Americas to perform flexible ureteroscopy with the first single use flexible ureteroscope. And this uh, endoscopic image from the LithoView uh, demonstrates that we're able to uh, identify and treat stones just as we would with a standard flexible ureteroscope. Uh, our image quality was excellent. And there's no doubt that a single use ureteroscope offers, um, uh, has had similar optics and maneuverability as standard flexible ureteroscopes, that the single use ureteroscope provides the urologist with a brand new flexible ureteroscope for every case, eliminating the need for uh, sterilization and handling of the scope. Uh, and there's no doubt that the single use flexible ureteroscopes had a major impact worldwide uh, in the ability to perform flexible ureteroscopy in, across all parts of the world. Now, since the LithoView came onto the market in 2015, there are now six additional companies that are making single-use flexible ureteroscopes. 
And if you would have been at the American Urological Association meeting, uh, which was supposed to be in May in Washington, DC, you would have seen all these companies and all these new single use flexible ureteroscopes. So I do believe that this concept is here to stay. I believe another significant advance in ureteroscopy to manage ureteral stones that have not passed is the use of the ureteral access sheath. Multiple companies make ureteral access sheaths and we like using the ureteral access sheath for a number of different reasons. First, after placement of the ureteral access sheath, it allows for straightforward and, uh, passage of the flexible ureteroscope uh, into the proximal ureter uh, and subsequently into the intrarenal collecting system. So it allows us to have rapid access to the proximal and mid ureter and the kidney. And these are data from our initial study uh, that demonstrated that routine use of the ureteral access sheath could offer a 20% reduction in time, which basically led to a significant in cost reduction in our operating room. In addition, routine use of a ureteral access sheath will also decompress the kidney from the irrigation that's needed during flexible ureteroscopy. And having decreased pressures within the collecting system not only improves the visualization during stone fragmentation, but will also reduce the chance of high pressures within the collecting system and therefore uh, causing uh, potential sepsis. So we routinely use the ureteral access sheath. Well, what happens if you're not able to place an access sheath at the beginning of the case, if you have a difficult to access ureter? Well, the two options are you can put up a stent and come back in a week or two or you can balloon dilate and treat the narrowing of the ureter and then place the access sheath. The advantage of stenting is that it's minimal risk and minimal trauma to the ureter. However, if you stent the patient and bring them back for a second procedure, it does necessitate a second procedure with increasing cost and increasing stent discomfort for the patient. Well, what about balloon dilation? If you can dilate the ureter, place your access sheath and complete the procedure, now you only have to do a single procedure, but there's the perceived risk of ureter or trauma for those patients that would need balloon dilation of the ureter. Now, initial studies of ureteral dilation were performed back in the late 1980s. And from this initial study, where the ureter was dilated to 15 to 18 French with ureteral dilating balloons, they were able to dilate successfully in 98% of the patients. And there was a normal intravenous pilogram uh, in uh, 98% of the people on follow-up. And I think you're all familiar with balloon dilation of the ureter. Um, however, some have commented that you can create significant ureteral trauma with balloon dilation with ureteral access sheath passage. And initial studies suggested that injury was as high as 45%, but I would offer that placement of a ureteral stent will result in the normal healing of the ureter in the vast majority of cases. So what is the current status of balloon dilation of the ureter? These are data from a retrospective study that we performed at Duke in partnership with the University of California, San Diego, in 2015, where we identified um, over 100 patients who
who had undergone ureteral balloon dilation, and we assessed the ability to dilate the ureter complications and stone free rates in these individuals. And in 151 patients that had undergone balloon dilation with an 18 French balloon, we found the incidence of intraoperative perforation only in 5% of the patients. This was four patients that had a slight split of the ureteral mucosa or perforation, and only one patient in the entire series developed a ureteral stricture after balloon dilation. So again, safe and effective to perform ureteroscopy. And recent data in over 440 patients that use the ureteral access sheath showed that the incidence of ureteral stricture only in one patient after uh, ureteroscopy or use of the access sheath and that the stricture rate when using an access sheath was similar to that of ureteroscopy without a sheath. So beside the digital flexible ureteroscope and the ureteral access sheath, we also believe that the homeum laser has had a major impact in our ability to successfully remove stones uh, in the ureter. The homeum laser has a wavelength that's not selectively absorbed and it fragments stones of all compositions. In addition, it's the only multi-purpose laser that has both stone hemostatic and tissue effects. So the homeum laser is flexible uh, and it will fragment stones of any composition. And recent studies have demonstrated that by manipulating the homeum laser power settings and the pulse width that you can uh, optimize the fragmentation, uh, uh, fragmentation of stones of varying compositions. And with a high power, low frequency setting, you can bust or fragment the stone. Uh, this is very valuable for breaking stones into large fragments. However, you get rapid burn back of the laser file. And with a low power laser setting, uh, low power high frequency, we dust the stone. This creates very small stone particles with minimal fiber burn back. And so we found that at high power settings, one joule at 10 Hertz, we can break the stone up into large pieces in contrast, patients with a low power, high frequency setting, such as 0.2 joules at 50 Hertz, we can paint the stone and just create sand within the collecting system that can easily be flushed out uh, with irrigation. Another improvement in the homeum laser has been the in introduction of a ball tip laser fiber. And the ball tip laser fiber has the advantage of needing reduced force of insertion. And these are data from our laboratory where we measured the uh, force needed to pass a standard fiber in red or a ball tip laser fiber in blue, showing that um, it took a lot less force for the surgeon to advance the ball tip laser fiber through the working channel uh, than with a standard laser fiber. Well, why is that important? Uh, that was important uh, because there's less risk of injury to the collecting system. So where are we going with ureteroscopy for the management of ureteral stones? Well, I think we'll be seeing more written about uh, high power homium lasers, as well as the introduction of the super pulse tulium laser to fragment stones. Um, and so what's old in 2020? What's old is that most ureteral stones will pass spontaneously. Uh, and that second and third generation shockwave lithotripsy devices are less effective than the first generation HM3. 
What's old is that shockwave lithotripsy requires more adjunctive and secondary procedures than does ureteroscopy, and that stenting is still morbid. What's new in 2020 is that medical expulsive therapy still works, that we can improve stone free rates with ureteroscopy by, by using the homeum laser and enhanced fiber optic imaging. And I think that the introduction of a single use digital ureteroscope has also had an impact, significant impact on our ability to manage ureteral stones successfully. So thank you. What are my take home points? Medical expulsive therapy is reasonable for ureteral stones before and after treatment. That digital ureteroscopy improves visualization and facilitates pathology identification. That the access sheath improves stone free rates and prolongs the life of the ureteroscope. That you should try and identify the appropriate laser setting depending on the size and the composition of your stone. And consider the use of single-use ureteroscopes to reduce costs and eliminate scope reprocessing and repair. So with that, I'd like to thank you again, uh, and I'd be uh, happy again to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Glenn Reminger. So it is very wonderful to hear your presentation about the ureteral stone management because it is very broadened up our insights about the urethral management. So I think because, because of the questions, uh, there are so many already questions uh, sent to me. I think we have started the discussion now because I think if we pull at the last session, it will be so uh, full. So uh, the first question from the Dr. Diandra. So he asked about that the, in Indonesia, we don't have the KC threat in Indonesia, actually, but that's the fact. So do you have any reference on any herbal or natural diet source of KC threat? Maybe you have um, an alternative for, for the KC threat? Um, so I know that there are a number of companies that make potassium citrate uh, that you can find on the internet. Uh, you can uh, get it with, without a prescription in, in, uh, over the internet. Uh, alternatively, you can use a preparation of sodium uh, bicarbonate as an alternative to potassium citrate to alkalinize the urine. So uh, sodium bicarbonate we use occasionally in patients that can't tolerate or can't afford the potassium citrate. And the sodium bicarbonate, we use a, a dose of uh, 1,300 milligrams twice a day to alkalinize the urine and raise the citrate. But do you have any caution if we use the natrium bicarbonate? I think there are some set effects, maybe in the electrolyte. Uh, yes, you, you have to. Uh, we, whenever we start uh, the sodium bicarbonate and even the potassium citrate, we will also always check a, a metabolic panel in our patients to check the serum electrolytes. Uh, in the case of potassium citrate, obviously, we'll check the serum potassium and with sodium bicarbonate we want to check the uh, serum sodium but we really haven't found any significant problems with the use of sodium um, bicarbonate okay thank you so we go to the second question uh, it's about the stone analysis so are you always perform the stone analysis after removal of urinary stone and give the medication therapy according to the stone analysis result? If not, when should we give the medicine for the urine stone disease? And then one thing, uh, if we have a data about the stone analysis and the 24 hour urine, uh, which one that you will uh, pick for the treatment? You know that maybe I, I want to inform to you first because actually now we don't have the complete examination for the 24 hour urine. Maybe we have only uh, maybe like the calcium 24 hour and then about the, the uh, magnesium, but we don't have like the P, like the acidity and then the citrate we don't have for the 24 hours. So I think it's one of the limitation in our country. Sure. 
So uh, if you have a your uh, so the the answer to the first part of the question is we always get a stone analysis um, when we first see the patient after their first stone. I think it's important to get a stone analysis. Um, and if the stone is uh, comes back uric acid or cysteine, well, you you've made your diagnosis. You you already know what the problem is. Uh, if it's a uric acid stone, most likely it's due to a very acidic urine, a pH of less than 5.5. And in those individuals, you want to alkalinize their urine. So you really don't need to do a 24-hour urine for those individuals. But for patients that make either a calcium oxalate or a calcium phosphate stone, there are five or six different reasons where, where you can make one of those stones. Is it because they're, they have hypercalciuria or hypocitraturia or high urinary uric acid or a combination of those things? So that's where a 24-hour urine really comes in handy because the 24-hour urine helps us to differ, differentiate the different types of calcium stone formation. So we will also routinely get a 24-hour urine uh, in our calcium stone formers to better define the underlying causes of their stones, and we can perform more selective medical therapy. So um, if you were to find a patient with hypercalciuria, I think starting that individual on a diuretic uh, like chlorthalidone uh, mm -hmm. to lower the urinary calcium and give them back a calcium supplement, or excuse me, a potassium supplement in the form of potassium citrate or potassium chloride, then I think that that would be a great, a great way to treat those individuals with calcium stones. But how do you follow up after the treatment? Maybe uh, is it for the three months, six months, or one year after the treatment? So once we identify the underlying cause of the patient's stones, uh, we usually will repeat a 24-hour urine about two months after their initial, we started them on their initial treatment, uh, and we bring them back to the office to discuss the results of the new 24-hour urine to see if they're taking their medication, to see if they're drinking their fluids, and whether or not we've corrected their problem. And then we see the patient back annually with a 24-hour urine to monitor their their uh, response to treatment, and also to monitor their compliance, to make sure they're taking their medication and drinking their fluids. And beside the annual 24-hour urine collection in follow-up, we'll also obtain repeat imaging once every two years to look for evidence of new stone formation. So I think it's important to follow these individuals. Uh, and with a 24-hour urine, we have the ability to see whether they're compliant and whether the, the treatment that we're offering the patient is having an impact. And with follow-up imaging, we can confirm that the patient's stone disease is under control. Okay, so regarding the imaging follow-up, I saw that you always use the digital tomosynthesis, uh, not the CT scan. Do you still use right. it? That that's correct. We, st we, we still use digital uh, tomosynthesis as our modality for, um, uh, for following up in calcium-containing stones. If the patient has a uric acid stone, you could either do a CT or an ultrasound to look for evidence of uh, recurrent stones. And in uh, Indonesia, if you don't have the digital tomosynthesis, you could even do ultrasound for follow-up of your patients, looking for evidence of new stones. But I think we need to do something to make sure that the patient's not making new stones and not just treat the patient and say, hey, you're all better, come back and see me if you have a problem. Because if you do that, the patient will come back to see you because they will be having a problem uh, down the road. Okay, so I think the last question's from me. Uh... If you do the flexible URS, I'm sorry, if you do the management for the urethral stone, uh, do you ever use the flexible URS or you always use the semi-rigid ureteroscope? Because I saw that you mentioned about the flexible URS for the urethral stone. 
Right. So uh, we use uh, the semi-rigid ureteroscope always in the distal ureter, and we will use a flexible ureteroscope uh, in the mid or proximal ureter if we cannot reach the stone, if we cannot reach the stone with the semi-rigid. Now, in, in a female, we're able to get up into the proximal ureter in many cases, and so we can use a semi-rigid scope. Uh, but in a male, sometimes it's hard to get over the iliac vessels. It's hard to reach the mid or proximal ureter with the semi-rigid scope. And so in those individuals, we use a flexible ureteroscope for ureteral stones. I think either one is fine. I think either one is fine. It just depends on what works better in your hands. Okay. Uh, regarding about the mid and the proximal ureteral stone, so if the distal part of the ureter is tortoise, do you still use the flexible URS or maybe you you use the antegrad, the percutaneous with the flexible? Which one do you prefer from, from the retrograde uh, or the antegrad? So the, the antegrad approach is, is a great approach uh, for proximal ureteral stones or even mid ureteral stones that are impacted. Um, and so uh, I think either way, uh, either from above or below, uh, we find that many times going from above is easier and using an integrate approach because the ureter is dilated and we can use a larger scope. We don't have to use a flexible ureteroscope. We can use a flexible nephroscope. So that's an excellent question. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Glenn Reminger. So I think we can go to the last session. Uh, the topic is about the advance of, in the management of kidney calculi, which will be presented by the Dr. Nur Rashid, our Indonesian Neurological Association president. And uh, I will read the short CV of him. So the Dr. Nur Rashid is the president of the IUA and he's in the, an attending physician from the Cipto Mangan Kusumo Hospital. And he is also an Indonesian expert in the urinary stone management. So, Dr. Nur, the time is yours. Thank you, Dr. Widi. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to uh, as an president of Indonesian Urological Association, especially to Prof. Glenn Preninger, to already proving a very good time with us and sharing your knowledge with us, especially in area uh, of the stone treatment and medical treatment for the stone. And also I'm honored uh, to have this opportunity to speak in the one occasion with you. And of course, to WD, I have to say thank you because you already set up uh, this uh, program and it's happened today. Thank you, Dr. Topic about uh, first <clears throat> about the, what the goal of uh, kidney stone management and, and after this, we will see what the guide, current guideline treatment in the stone management, and then what the best diagnostic to evaluate our patient with the stone kidney, and then how many choices of the treatment, especially with the uh, minimal invasive treatment. The goal of the kidney treatment, we have to the, the, the idea is to preserve or reverse or an increase uh, renal function if there is any or any problem there. Like a Prof. Reminger said, the treatment is start from the uh, emergency room. We have to treat the colic patient, even with the uh, medical treatment or with the uh, interventional. But the concern is we prevent the renal function or the ac acute kidney insufficient. The idea to treat for treatment is uh, early is to re relieve the obstruction and then the uh, manage if there is an infection and of course the uh, we have to evacuate all the stone and can reach the uh, stone free rate. This is a guideline even in Europe, America and of course in our country the difference is even the stone in the kidney size uh, between 10, 20, between 10 to 20 or more than 20, because not of uh, all the hospital already has a minimal invasive treatment like uh, PCNL or uh, ESWL. So there is a place 
in our country to do open surgery. In, in our hospital, usually when the patient came with the uh, colicky pain or the uh, backache pain, usually we do ultrasound. And if we found that there is a stone, especially when uh, the stone more than 20 uh, millimeters, usually we straight to do a CT scan, especially with the CT urography non-contrast. Because uh, this is like we say before, if we use a contrast, this is possibility to make an erase for a acute kidney injury. Even in our guideline, we say that if you want to treat the stone, you have, it's better to do a contrast study. But if we know that this case not suitable for the ESWL, usually we straight to do a minimal invasive treatment. The minimal invasive treatment depends on the location and then the, uh, the size of the stone. And now with the uh, CT urography, the, we, have, we can uh, understand how hard looks like the stone. So we prevent for overuse of the ESWL like before. Even ESWL is non-invasive, but uh, minimal invasive or endoscopic procedure now become a major treatment in a stone kidney. But like I said before, in my country, open surgery still a place there. But if we do uh, minimal invasive, of course we have to try to treat with as minimal and invasively as possible. The successful treatment with the ESWL, beside the size, location, and com of course the composition of the stone. But sometimes patients come to us without the history or without uh, there is uh, information about the composition of the stone. But with the CT scan, we now get a, a quite good information how hard the stone. This is when the era uh, ESWL in the golden era in 1990. At that time, we already know that even the stone below than 20 millimeters, the successful to make the stone free rate still about uh, 60 percent. Of course, if we, we can differentiate that the stone is not so hard, we can increase the st stone free rate. Even until now, there is no guideline or uh, no benchmark, but uh, we understand that if the stone more than 1,000 Houndsville unit, it is not ideal with, to treat with the ASWL. In our center, if the size of the stone more than one centimeter and the size more than 1,000, usually we suggest to the patient to do minimal invasive, depends on the position and the location of the stone. For ESWL in the lower pool, we already know that even we can break down the stone until the small fragment, but sometimes the fragment still remain in that calyx and it can uh, make the stone recurrent to make another stone formation. And the other, why the uh, calicial low poke stone was decreased, uh, the result to make uh, stone free rates is one is because sometimes it's steep in the fudal plant in the fudal, in the fudal, in the fudibular pelvic angle. And the second is a long calyx more than one centimeter. Long skin to the stone more than one centimeter. Sorry, this uh, miswriting mis here. Narrow in fundibulum below than five millimeters. And for the stone with the uh, resistant to uh, ESWL like calicial, calcium oxalate monohydrate, brucite, and cysteine stone. The choices for the minimal invasive. The, the most popular now besides ESWL because for the kidney stone, usually 
we do PCNL. For the PCNL, we, we need to do the targeting to find the perfect puncture and then to do the right dilatation to get the low access to the stone and then to trip the, the stone and to make a complete a stone free rate with the minimal risk of injury. Avoid, we can avoid it major vessel, we can avoid it bowel and the lung too. Especially now, we use a CT scan from the uh, transverse uh, section, we can uh, exactly know the position of the colon. Even we can find one per 100, uh, thousand people, the colon position was in the uh, behind of, uh, or we call it retro uh, renal colon. The shortest distance, not always the best. Obtaining the good puncture, good planning to the puncture, opacity, the collectial system with using the contrast and the technique of puncture is uh, important to this treatment. And the size of instrument now become a smaller and a smaller, but the, the other side, the stone not uh, still in the big size in our country. <clears throat> Where is the site we, we, we can choose the puncture? Uh, we can choose even from the lower pool, mid pool, or the upper pool colleagues. But from the study, we can see from more than uh, 5,000 cases, 3,000 cases was doing from the lower colleagues, like in this case, but about 30% uh, doing from 10% uh, was doing from the upper pool. It is uh, the, the if every puncture uh, site has own uh, advantages. Like for example, in the upper pool, especially with the stone located just in the upper pool. It is better to go straight to the upper pool or the stone impacted in the UPG or the proximal uh, uretric stone like Prof. Uh, Preminger said before. Or in the case, in the same time, sometimes we can find UPG stenosis with the stone. So we can do in the same time, uh, PCNL to take it out the stone and we do endopilotomy. We can do with the, uh, uh, like a TUR, BNI, like we do in the bladder neck incision, or now if we have a laser, it is better of course, we use a laser, we can use a homium or tulium to, to incise the uh, structure in pilotomy. Of course, it is better to do in morbid obese patient because the, uh, uh, if comparing between the lower uh, lower calic to the skin, comparing with the upper calic to the skin, of course the upper calic is a uh, <clears throat> and the selected lux burden. If the lux burden stone, sometimes we easier to go from the upper pool because easy to come to the lower calic. Of course, in the lower calic, but of course it's sometimes stone come out to the ureter, we can get, uh, take it out from the, this, uh, the other advantage of the upper pool uh, puncture, we have to understand that there is a di diaphragma or we can make a complication like hydrothorac, uh, pneumothorac, or sometimes increase the blood transition. But in our department, in our study, we can compare, there is no uh, risk to, to upper pool puncture, especially we do in the prone. Why? Because in the upper pool, usually we found the hydronephrosis bigger or a wide, more widening in another colleagues. So we more easier to puncture, we more easier to dilate and put the unplugged sheet to the calicial system without a uh, complication of the bleeding. And of course, we can choose below subcostal or sub supracostal. There is a study on that, but if we, if we want to do supracostal, it has to be avoided supracostal 12. And the puncture, it has 
to be and better to do and full expiration because the uh, diaphragma will be going up. Still in the upper 12 ribs uh, and then just doing above the upper 12 ribs to prevent injury to artery intercostal and doing x-ray thorax immediately after surgery. And then what will we choose in the minimal invasive kidney surgery stone? For the PCNL, we can go lower, but how low? And the position, we can choose prone or we will, we will move to supine, which better to our team. Or sometime in the case, not so big stone, below than two centimeters, but so hard stone, impossible to do ESWL, we can choose even mini PCNL or RRS. Sometimes we find the stone with the uh, complex and the multiple stone in the uh, colleagues, we have to do multipuncture or since in our center, since we did come back from state, from your centers, we start to do etches. Thank you for a prop remainder. Uh, that's why we start etches after we did come back to our department. And now our colleague, one of our colleagues start doing free fluoroscopy PCNL2. And then how low can we go? Of course, mini, mini PCNL, PCNL standard is already 50 years, but uh, the size between uh, 24 to 30 French. Since 1998, the Jackman doing the first time to the children. But since 2000, uh, Lamit doing in the adult and now rapidly and increasingly popular doing in adult cases. Some, uh, <clears throat> some size of the uh, amplage or nephroscope we can find. But the most important, if we want to see the risk of a uh, complication is the amplage itself. For the normal, usually we use amplage 26 until uh, 30 friends in our department. For mini PCNL, we do 21 until 15 friends. In our department, we never using ultra mini. We don't have that. And of course, we don't have to for a micro. Before, if the uh, sometime we can do uh, for mini is a rigid cystoscope seven French or a flexible uh, ureteroscope 19. 0.5 French, but of course we have, some, we have to have a, a homium. But in our department, before we have a laser, even we have a mini. We do with the little class, little tripter, and of course uh, take it out the stone with the uh, forcep. With the super mini, of course we have to do with the ESWL. Uh, until now, even there is a. Uh, Tulium for the uh, stone treatment, but in our department, we just using uh, homium for the treatment of the stone and tulium for the uh, uh, prostate and the uh, malignant in the bladder or a kidney. Microperk become, uh, we go to the lower size, but I think we have to uh, remind that maybe it will be increase the price. If we comparing the standard mini or ultra mini, the high stone free rate, of course, higher in the uh, standard and mini PCNL. But in the good hand, of course, in ultra mini or in micro, the stone free rate is good. But what we different is maybe the uh, complication for the blood transfusion in ultra mini on micro PCNL. There is no report on that. But I said before, especially in our country, we have to remind the price of the treatment, especially in the era of the government insurance. There is a limitation of payment back 
to the hospital from the uh, insurance. So we have count clearly which one ideal to our patient and the our and our hospital. Oops, sorry. Sorry. What's the problem? Okay. If we comparing uh, from the meta analysis, we can found that mini PCNL and PCNL in stone free rate is comparable. In the hemoglobin uh, decrease, of course, in uh, more favorable in mini PCNL, in a blood transfusion, of course, more decrease or more lower in uh, mini PCNL. And the operating time was uh, more favor in normal or standard PCNL. In a hospital stay was uh, prefer in mini PCNL, but in our hospital, comparing between mini and uh, normal PCNL, the uh, hospital stay is the same. Or the fever is comparable and the perforation, of course, in this data we found in meta-analysis, we found the mini PCNL much better. How about the uh, position of the uh, PCNL? When I start, when I finished my uh, urology in 1990, 1999, uh, I was start PCNL. At that time, almost all the people doing with the uh, prone. And until now, I'm happy with the prone. Even some of our colleagues now move to the uh, supine position. If we comparing here from the uh, CROES study, we can see that about 80% of the uh, urologists still doing with the uh, prone position, about 25% uh, doing with the uh, supine position. Like in the uh, Europe, North America, South Africa, and of course, if we see the number of the center, the center, 50 below than 50 cases per year or until more than 100 per year look like prone is still uh, favorable favorite but if we we already start we have to know that the prone has an advantage and has an advantage too for example with the prone easy to puncture easier to routine because the uh, a bl uh, flat bluntening of a system. We can do multiple puncture, easier for the morbid case. And of course, especially for a horse kidney, it's better uh, to do with the upper puncture. But of course, with the supine, we can do a synchronized like uh, eight years, uh, doing from the anterograde and retrograde in simultan and then uh, limitation in the preparing and the total time, uh, no need to reposition in the patient. But of course, we have to know that in the supine, there is a longer track, difficult uh, to dilate because the uh, kidney not dilatation and the limitation, of course, in the field and difficult also to the rotate but at the risk of the uh, colon, sometimes we think that the position in the prone will be increased, the, uh, will be decreased the colon uh, uh, complication. But if we see the study from a CT scan in the supine position, the colon will be more go up. So it is uh, if we do, if we have a case with the quiet retro, we can choose still in the prone, but better to use a guide, uh, pro, uh, fluoroscopy and ultrasound, or you can do with the uh, 
supine position. The, the popular position now is uh, Gardaco modified uh, Valdivia position now for the, our colleague doing uh, supine position. If we compare it between the prone and supine, for the, uh, there is no significant, uh, but supine position is better in complication. For, for the stone free rate day here, but no deficient in breeding complication, no significant rate in pelvic perforation, uh, no significant uh, differentiation in hospital stay, and of course, significant difference in operating time. But of course, like Prof. Reminger say, you have to do as what you or your team better to do. My colleague now start doing a fluoroscopy free. Uh, we know that with the ultrasound guided, there is no exposure of uh, radiation. But of course, this is uh, ultrasound. Uh, there is this advantage. I think need to do operator more skillful. I mean, the totally free fluoroscopy guided puncture and dilatation is a second step or another step after the people already competent to do with the fluoroscopy. Why? Because we are already familiar. Even at the first time, the radiation exposure will be increased. But in our uh, center, we just doing a uh, very low number or a minute using a uh, fluoroscopy because we just doing when we need. If we comparing here, there is no difficulty, no different in stone free rate. This is a study was doing by uh, Dr. Poncho, our Poncho Bureau, our uh, staff member, and safe also, and has the same efficacy. So in our department, me myself doing in a prone position, Dr. Poncho doing in a supine and a free fluoroscopy, and we did doing with the eight years. And DVD is doing with the prone and supine too, of course, depend on what case he found. What the access we have to do. Sometimes we can have to do in multiple because uh, there is so many stone in the caliceal system beside uh, the uh, uh, stack horn or just small stone in the uh, telum, but more of the stone in caliceal. So we have to prepare. If we prepare, to multi-cali, multi-puncture, it is better to do the puncture before the dilatation one track. So I mean, put the puncture wire and then put the guide wire, a zebra wire from this cali through the ureter. For if we need the tree, just put the tree. Sometimes we, did, we didn't need any more even in the second or the third position, we just take it out the uh, guide wire. But if, up, if we do the puncture for the second or the third puncture after dilatation or after the treatment, usually not so easy because the moving of the kidney and then not dilatation anymore and not so easy to find, especially if the uh, stone was uh, loosened stone. This is uh, what we can do now. If we don't want to do a, a multipuncture, we can do simultaneously PCNL in each year. This is comparable, of course, between uh, uh, multipuncture in the stone free rate, but in complication, uh, each year is better. And the how about, uh, like Prof. Minger said, uh, when it comes to Indonesia, I hope at the first time, it will be the uh, uh, one treatment will be popular at that time. But after we try, especially in the center, 
whereas uh, so many or not just one urologist using one uh, flexible cystoscope, usually the the the, the this uh, this tool will be quite easy to break. But the good thing now we have a single-use flexible in our country and or for the urologists who are interested to do a, a RRS, I suggest to start using with the uh, single use uh, flexible, so you don't afraid to break it, this one. And of course, like a Prof. Freeman just said, if we use a single use, every patient will get the new uh, tools. In our center, me, myself, always using assessive because uh, it's easier to go and out uh, because sometimes we find the hard stone, we have to use a basket nitinol to take it out the stone and we have to go uh, out and in several times with the accessit, it is better to do like that. Of course, we will decrease uh, the pressure in the pelum and because the increased irrigation flow and of course make the uh, healthy calcial system more clearly. But this is uh, still a uh, <clears throat> concern that it can cause injury. That's why usually in our department, we usually we inspected all the ureter until the pelum with the uh, semi-rigid uh, URS to see uh, the condition of the ureter and also the dilate the ureter. After this, and then we put the uh, ultra uh, <clears throat> ureter assess it. But if it is impossible, usually we just put the double G stand. We wait until once and then two weeks and almost of the case will be succeed. If we still cannot put the access it, Usually, we can uh, put the uh, flexible URS without accessing. If we start to use uh, access, uh, RERS, especially if we use a reusable uh, RERS, you have to remember that our laser can make injured to the uh, lens. So to prevent this, we have to put the tip of the laser minimally one quarter or one third from the area. How to treat is we can do a pulverizing like a propane preminger say. You can use a small uh, power with the high frequency. If we want to break a big stone, we can use a small frequency with the high power. Sometimes we have to popcorn because we cannot move the stone from the lower colic or to middle colic to phylum or uh, upper pool and then we can use popcorn treatment with the lower uh, with the high fre low frequency middle frequency in the uh, middle power too this is uh, like in the case where is the stone on the left side we can see the stone, a hard stone. It is impossible to break stone to be a pulverized. In this case, we, there is no problem, but we know that we have uh, some uh, thing to do is take it out the stone with the uh, basket after that. After the treatment, we can see the stone will be like this. With the not so hard stone, we can see that this is the pulverizing of the stone and the stone will be taken out himself with the, with the urine. So we don't have to uh, uh, using bas basket in this case. Do we use a single use or reusable? Prof. Preminger say, so I don't think we don't need, I don't need to uh, more talk about this. This is uh, already I said before, sorry. This is uh, the case where I have 
the patient with 20 of uh, 24 years lady every year almost every year he come to me because complaining of the stone uh, expulsing from the uh, Randall's block and then go up to the calicial system and at the same time make the quality pain and obstruct it in the upper ureter and the patient usually come to uh, our office in the uh, septic condition. In this case, after we treat the stone obstructed in the uh, pelum, and then we go to the uh, calicial system, we see clearly where is the big stone, and then we incise the calyx, uh, the calyx with the tulium in this case, I use the tulium because uh, more bloodless in this case. After we can open the calyx, the calyx and then we break the stone until we can see here, this is inside. Sorry. We can see this is the calyx already take it out the stone. We go inside to the calyx and then break it up the stone. This lady was happened uh, abortion because of the septic at the at the first uh, pregnancy. After that, uh, I said to the uh, this is after the uh, lady was happened with the abortion, and she said to me that she want to get the children, and then we try to incise any possible stone to prevent the stone, especially just uh, one hour free of the stone. But the good thing, he come to me already, uh, not come back of uh, obstruction already for the last two years. So we know the advanced treatment giving us the choices for the clinical treatment. We can choose the ideal and the optimal and also easier in our hand. The safe is the very important and the most important when managing every patient with the kidney stone disease. The choices of treatment is based on aim of the surgery, facility, the kidney stone algorithm in, our, in your uh, hospital, patient factor comorbidity, preference and ability of the surgeon, and of course of the team and in Indonesia because we have a national insurance era where the price is not so high, we, we consider the cost and the quality of our treatment. Thank you, especially for uh, Dr. Poncho, Indra Warman, Widi, and Febri to do this uh, paper. Thank you very much, Widi. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Noor. It's wonderful uh, presentation. You show us about the variation of the operation for the kidney management. So we conclude to the question session. There are some questions uh, already sent to me. The first question is uh, from Dr. Bitramala Japri. So is there any limitation of the time that we can do PCNL? Just like we do the TURP, we usually uh, do TURP, especially for the monopolar. Uh, we use it the limit about uh, 60 minutes. Is there any limitation for the PCNL? Maybe Dr. Noor? Dr. Noor? Okay. Of course, I, I, I will ask, uh, of course, uh, Prof. Manager about this one. In my, in my, uh, uh, what we do in our hospital, if we know that the stone is big enough, sometimes it's, we, in, if comparing within the TURP with the PCNL, in the, the TURP, we are open the uh, blood vessel. But in the PCNL, even we uh, make incision, uh, dilatation in parenchyma, but we put the unplugged. There is no imbibition of the uh, water inside to the system. So we don't have to use uh, saline in this case, you can use still water. But what we have to do, how long you can go, how long you can treat, you have to see 
how many blood already goes out. We have to see the color of water drains in your uh, in your uh, treatment. You have you have to ask the anesthesiologist the condition of the patient. If there is everything is okay, there is no limitation of the time. Maybe Prof. Preminger can uh, help us to discuss this problem. Well, um, I agree with with uh, your comments and that uh, we we will judge the length of time based on the amount of bleeding. Uh, and also it, whether there's a, a trauma or a perforation to the collecting system. If uh, we find that uh, the collecting system's intact and there's minimal bleeding, then two or three hours uh, is very reasonable. We've, we've, we've done four or five hours if we have a complete, a complete staghorn stone. But um, uh, I think that if you have a, a large perforation of the collecting system, uh, the safe thing to do is to stop at that point and put up, put it in a tube and come back uh, for a second stage procedure. You're exactly right. Thank you, Prof. Okay, so I want to ask to both of you, uh, how about you, the Prof. Glenn Preminger? I saw that you usually use the general anesthesia for the PCNL. Is there any role of the spinal anesthesia for the PCNL? Because in our center, we usually use the the spinal anesthesia. So I think it can limit our time for doing PCNL. Um, we've been very happy with our general anesthesia for these patients. We can get them relaxed. Um, uh, our routine is to use a prone split leg position as opposed to a supine. And that, that way we can do uh, uh, ureteroscopy and percutaneous stone removal at the same time. Um, and we have done uh, PCNL under spinal anesthesia, but our, our preference is general, and we, we don't find that we have any limitations with that. Yes. Uh, of course, like I said before, if uh, what we do is depends on our culture. For example, in Indonesia, uh, people, some of the people are afraid of uh, uh, total anesthesia. They were afraid the history that the patient after this anesthesia, they didn't awake anymore. So the patient sometimes uh, choose for uh, spinal. But comparing with the Europe or America, so many patients complaining about the uh, radicular pain after the uh, spinal. That's why most of the uh, urologists in Europe or uh, North America don't want to do uh, uh, spinal anesthesia because the complaining after the spinal anesthesia. So it is depend on the where we are and of course our colleague in anesthesia in, in our center at the first time the head of anesthesia want to do a study uh, a pain uh, the, the, the pain score between the uh, spinal and the uh, uh, total anesthesia. And then after that, everybody was happy and the patient, most of the patient was choose with the spine, uh, a spinal anesthesia because most Indonesian people still afraid of uh, a total uh, anesthesia. That's the reason. Thank you. Thank you. So I heard about that the Prof. Glenn Preminger said the, the prone split leg PCNL. I saw so many PCNLs in your centers always do you always do in, in in that way with the prone split leg and then you always do the endoscopy guided PCNL but uh, I don't know in Indonesia we usually just do the standard prone PCNL so I want to ask uh, if you do the endoscopy guided PCNL with the prone split leg uh, which calyx that you want to target is is it you always target the upper pole or you always target the lower pole so, so like Professor Noor said very nicely in his talk, uh, we prefer the upper pole. We think the upper pole access um, always gives us um, a, better, um, a better view of the renal pelvis and we can usually get into the lower pole and the proximal ureter. Um, if we enter in through the lower pole, sometimes it's difficult to get to the upper pole or, or even the, the uh, 
the proximal ureter. ureter. So an upper pole access, uh, while it has its, its potential risks, um, I think always gives us better access to the collecting system. And so we're very aware of where the, the pleura is on the CT scan. We, we try to stay um, uh, no higher than over, uh, we will go over the 12th rib uh, and sometimes over the 11th rib if we know where the pleura is. So having a CT at the beginning of the case, so you know what the anatomy looks like, I, I think is very important. But uh, we always prefer a higher is better, I think, for percutaneous access. Okay, so, but you know that the trends is now getting to go to the supine channel. So how about it? Because I read some articles that from the supine even, even we, we, we go to calyx and then, but we can go to the upper calyx easily more if we compare to the channel. So how about your uh, perspective about the, the future of the supine PCNL? Sorry? Well, the, the, the so I want to talk about the how. Yeah. I think that, that if you look across um, Asia and, and Europe, the supine PCL is, uh, PCNL is much more popular than in the United States. Yeah. Um, I, I agree, and there must be something good about the, the supine PCL or, or everyone wouldn't be doing it. Um, we uh, have done a few of them at, at our institution, and we're, we're trying to learn more. Um, and I think that it, it, re, it depends on what your comfort is, and if you're comfortable doing supine PCNL, there's no a problem at all with doing that. It's just that I've um, I've trained and and for many years have been doing prone, and so we're more familiar and comfortable with that, and so that's what we like doing. I think overall, uh, both of them will are excellent ways to access the kidney. Okay, thank you, Prof. Glenn. So I think we have some still some questions. Uh, the next question is came from the Dr. Herlian Budiman. He asked about the how about if if we have the patient with the osteoporotic disease, which in, in need for the calcium supplement, does it more faster progress on performing kidney stone than the normal people? The, uh, uh, I mean, um, the the patient had the osteoporotic disease, so I think maybe the, right. the calcium is lower. And the normal so, level. and then yeah so um it, it's our if a patient has osteoporosis and needs to be on a calcium supplement um we don't want to stop the calcium supplement so as i mentioned what we'll do at that point is we will check a 24-hour urine and look at the urinary calcium uh in many women um on calcium supplements especially in those women who are postmenopausal. Uh, their urinary calcium will still be normal uh, on calcium supplementation. But if it's elevated, then I think it's, it's absolutely fine to start them on a diuretic to lower the calcium in the urine. And studies have shown that you will actually increase the bone density with uh, long-term thiazide therapy in your, in your calcium stone formers. So the thiazide actually not only reduces the calcium in the urine, but it protects the bone. Okay, so I think it's very clear. So the next, the next question is about the pediatric case. Uh, he asked about the in the pediatric stone cases, maybe in the PLM and the calicell stones, without the availability of the mini channel or, or RIRS, who suggests for the BCNL or open surgery, maybe in maybe for Dr. and for the Prof. Glenn Preminger? Okay. Maybe Dr. Nur Rashid first? Right. Okay. At the first time, when we don't have a mini PCNL, we do use a normal PCNL. The, the smaller we have, 26 friends uh, unplugged sheet. Sometimes we just use a nephroscope without the unplugged sheet. Uh, with the uh, laser, laser uh, breaking the stone, or 
uh, <clears throat> we can using uh, dilatation before. That mean, I mean that we can we can put the uh, ureter catheter and then make uh, dilatation of the functional kidney kidney calicial system and like proprimanger say usually even in the children we can find the upper pool is quite more uh, dilated comparing with the other uh, uh, calyx especially when the in the uh, big stone so uh, our study we found that of course it is more higher in uh, blood loss comparing after we use a uh, small but if comparing with the open surgery because we know in the children it is possibility to recur someday if we already do open surgery it is not so easy to do even uh, pcnl in the next because sometimes it's fibrotic there thank you please help me prof <laughs> um i agree with you that um uh, you can uh, access, uh, uh, we in the past have used the standard nephroscope in our, in our pediatric patients. If we can use, if we can uh, get a smaller scope, that would be ideal. Uh, but even with um, uh, a 24 French uh, access sheath uh, and we can use our standard scope, we find that uh, the, the incidence of bleeding is, is uh, is not that significant, depending on the uh, the age of the patient, and we're able to get to the stone uh, without too much problem. Okay, thank you, both of you. So I think we still have some, maybe two or three questions. Uh, this is technique uh, question. Uh, so when we do the busting or dusting technique from in the laser treatment, is there any specific criteria of the stone size or location, or maybe the hardness of the stone, or maybe we can try first to the laser, the stone, and if we see the stone is very hard, and then we can change to the fragmentation technique, and then, but if the stone is not hard, we can go to the, to the dusting. So how about you, Prof. Len? Yes, Weedy, I think you're, you're exactly right that um, while it's easy to say that I'm going to break up this stone or I'm going to dust this stone, you really don't know until you get to see the stone and you start the fragmentation. And really the composition of the stone will dictate what's the best way to treat that. Um, so if it's a calcium oxalate monohydrate stone, it's, it's very black and smooth. I know that, that, that I, can, I can try to dust that stone, but it's not gonna work very well. And I'm gonna have to use a higher power to fragment that stone. But if I get inside and see, uh, the stone looks to be a calcium oxalate dihydrate stone where it's, it's tan and it, it has speculations on it. Then I turn down the power, uh, 0.2 in 50 or point, 0.2 in 80, depending on the laser I have, and I can dust that stone very easily. So I, I agree with you that the composition of the stone is the most important factor to decide what's the best way to set your laser settings. Okay, so regarding of the laser setting, uh, from the presentation from the doctor, uh, you saw us that you incised the infundibulum with the tulium laser, can you tell us about the, the power of the laser? And maybe from the Prof. Glenn Preminger, do you agree if we have like the multiple stone in the multiple small calicial stone, but we can see there is like a small hole, do you still go to, to incise every, every hole to take the stone? Or maybe you have any criteria, maybe if there are three small holes, you know, we don't have to incise all of the hole, just, just pick the, the, the bigger stone, and then you incise the, the, the infinubulum, and then you take out the stone. How about it? Maybe from the Dr. Nur uh, first about the, the power of the laser, sorry. Usually, the, the power of tulium, the smaller power, usually 
there are 125, 820 uh, watts. But for the inside of the Kali cell system, we just using about 50 watts. So it is too small. Uh, the, 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 before we decided uh, which one uh, to incise, usually I see, is, is it the uh, thin or a thick uh, mucosa in front of the stone? If there is thick, it is possibility for the bleeding. Usually I didn't do that. Thank you. Okay. So how about you, Prof? So I, I thought that was a beautiful case that Professor Noor presented in a, in a patient that had a um, uh, nephrocalcinosis and probably a medullary sponge kidney. That was yes. a classic picture of a medullary sponge kidney. And we see these patients frequently. And it is our routine to incise all the stones that we see uh, if they're in these little holes. Um, I think it, I'd rather get them out when I'm doing the procedure than let them stay inside the kidney because eventually what's going to happen is they're going to come into the collecting system and cause a problem. So we will spend an extra 20 or 30 minutes and open up all these little holes to let the stones out. I, I don't think it causes any increased damage to the kidney and it eventually saves the patient uh, and that's why you haven't seen the patient in two years because you got rid of all of her stones up in the kidney. Um, and uh, hopefully you won't see her for another two years. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, Thank I you. saw like the case uh, with the medullary sponge <clears throat> in your clinic and then you always do the treatment with the medical management to control the 24 hour urine. Okay, so we have two questions more. I hope that the time is uh, enough. So in the case of the complex stone on horseshoe kidney case, which one do you prefer? Just remove the stones endoscopically or go forward with ismusectomy laparoscopy or robotic? Maybe sure, Dr. I think, oh, sorry. I, I think again, it depends on, on where the stone is located and how big the stone is. If it's a, if it's a smaller stone, less than say one and a half centimeters and it's it's more in the upper part of the horseshoe kidney, I think ureteroscopy is just fine. Uh, but if it's a large stone, um, uh, it's much easier to do percutaneous surgery. Everyone's scared to do percutaneous surgery of a horseshoe kidney. I think that with, with appropriate access, usually through the upper pole, uh, you can you can do a standard percutaneous surgery through a horseshoe kidney without too much problem. Wouldn't you agree with that, Dr. Nur? Yeah, I am agree with you, Prof. Especially now you have or we already have a flexible URS. If still possible, why we have to do a, a take a risk for the patient? We have to do a, with the flexible URS and then take it out the stone with the nitinol basket. But if the stone is big enough, of course, PCNN. But like a uh, question here, they ask, do we need doing uh, ismectomy? There is no more place for ismectomy since about 2000. When I was finished as a urologist, there is no more doing for uh, ismectomy because, because they didn't in, uh, re decrease the risk of the uh, uh, recurrent stone but we put the patient in a big surgery even now with the laparoscopy because there is no uh, advantage to do the ismectomy for the patient so just take it out the stone anything you can do leave it don't do ismectomy thank you are you oh. agree prof <laughs> thank you <Yeah>. very much <laughs> all are <agree>, great <laughs> okay so for the last questions uh if we want to do the RIRS, do we have to routinely uh, put the WG stand first, or maybe we can go first, uh, go directly to the to do the RIRS? Mm -hmm. That's the first question, and then the second, the last questions. Uh, if we want to laser the stones with the hardness more than one thousand uh, Hounsfield unit, uh, do we need? Is there any? Uh, modification or technique maybe we can use i don't know you, in the indoor clinic prof Glenn, you you can use the moses 
the Moses laser uh, that have a higher power but less retropulsion. Or maybe we should shift to the other source in dealing hardness hardstone. Maybe with the con uh, the conventional PCNL. How about it? Maybe uh, to the doctor nervous about the RIRS for the double gistan the, the pre op. Of course, when we start, usually uh, somebody like me, of course, when we start with the uh, flexible URS at the first time, the size of the flexible URS is quite big enough, and the arm plus uh, urethral sheet, of course, uh, big enough too. So we routinely put the double G step. But now we have a smaller flexible URS, even the uh, single use flex uh, flexible URS and we have a smaller unplugged seat, usually we just, uh, in our department, we just doing uh, optic dilatation with the semi-rigid uh, semi uh, URS. After that one, usually we can go straight with the put uh, ultra uh, urethral sheet, and then we do with the uh, a laser. But how, how hard the stone? we cannot break with the laser. The standard holmium can break any heart of the stone. There is no heart stone cannot break with the laser. This is a, 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 a what we find, but maybe uh, the uh, procedure you, you cannot do it with the perforizing of the stone. Thank you. Okay, so how about you, Prof. Plan? about the, the double G stand prep and about the laser for the one more than 1000 hospital sure. so, so we it's not our routine to to stand patients before you read oroscopy however um there are patients where we have problems getting an access sheath in uh and in those patients uh the safe thing to do is to um put up a stent and then we do bring them back and 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 uh a week or so later now, I, I mentioned during my presentation that we also still do uh, balloon dilation of the ureter, which I do believe is safe if done uh, properly. Uh, and uh, that will uh, also uh, avoid the need to pre-stent the patient. Um, for harder stones, yes, we, you will need to increase the power on the laser. And so you won't be able to use the, the dusting settings I think you need to use at least one joule of energy and try to um, use about 20, um, 20 hertz. But uh, uh, to increase the power to uh, 0.8 joules or eight joules or, or um, excuse me, one joule on the homium laser uh, uh, and the tulium, the same thing. You would turn up the, the power uh, and potentially decrease the um, frequency of the laser. But you should be able to break up even hard stones uh, with the homium or the tulium laser. Okay, but how about the high power laser compared to the other technology like the MOSES? How about it? Well, uh, um, uh, again, we have a MOSES uh, laser and we find that it does work quite well. Um, is it worth the extra $30,000 to have the MOSES setting on it? Uh, I'm not sure that it is, um, but uh, we, we had a high power laser before we had the high power with the Moses and found that we were still able to do uh, quite well. So I don't think it's imperative that you have the Moses uh, setting um, or the Moses attachment on the high power laser. The Tulium is still quite new. I don't have, um, uh, we've only done a few cases on the Tulium, so I don't have enough experience to say that it's better than the high power or homium. Okay, so I think it's very clear answer. So I time limit is already exit. I'm sorry for the Dr. Noor and the Prof. Lampreminger. And that brings us to the, to the end. And once again, we thank you for Gl Prof. Lampreminger and Dr. Noor Rashid, who gave us so much knowledge. We hope that it will broaden up our insights, especially on the urinary stone management, and maybe try to apply it to our patient. But of course, we have to know the limitation and the obligation in our hospital, since different hospitals maybe will have different rules and equipment. So see you on our next series of International Euro Webinar from Indonesian Neurological Association. 
And last but not least, please stay safe during this pandemic and have a nice weekend. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. So we have to stop this meeting. I'm sorry.